that. OK, so welcome yeah. everybody. This is uh, our monthly journal club here at the Desert Center. It's one of the two journal clubs that we host, the other one being the Autism Journal Club. Now, this one is the Behavior Analysis Journal Club, and it's focused on disseminating good practice in the world of behavior analysis. At the Tizard Center, we have two ABAI verified courses, uh, both at the postgraduate level. So if you're thinking about starting to become a board certified behavior analyst, you can check out our website at tizard.org and you will find all the information you need uh, about the way we deliver the training and the content of our courses. We also have the peer review journal that we publish. It's called Tizard Learning Disability Review. So if you're working in the field of learning disabilities and you have nice um, data to share with the world, it could be either case study or small projects, please do consider submitting your work at TLDR, the Tizard Learning Disability Review. And again, you can find all the info on our website at tizard.org. Now, we are going to be giving you a free CEU for this event, and you just need to write down three keywords that I will say throughout the uh, session. If you're not board certified, but you still want some type of certificate to show that you've attended, you can email me at the end and you will just have to put CPD, Continuous Professional Development, on the subject so I know to prepare a relevant um, uh, certificate. All right, without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Nick Green. Nick is very active using behavior analysis to improve people's fitness and health. How cool is that? You tell me after you hear him uh, talk. I've uh, been following his work. I've uh, I've heard um, uh, a podcast that he was invited to, and I was amazed by his knowledge and the fact that he's really good at explaining how we can use the science uh, to uh, delve outside our comfort zone, being uh, you know intellectual and other developmental uh, disabilities. So hopefully this will inspire some of you to consider branching out, which is what we want to do. We want to get the science out there in all areas of human practice, not just uh, disabilities. So I'm sure you're in for a treat. Nick, I will uh, let you do your thing now and thank you again for uh, joining us today. The only thing I'll ask you before you get started is to just tell us what you're currently working on, just to set the context uh, with people. For example, I know you've got a podcast, but mm -hmm. if you could give us an overview of you know, what you're currently uh, you know, engaging with and then you can take it forward with your presentation. And thank you again. Yep, sure. Yeah, great. Thank you, Thanos. Um, yeah, again, I'm very thankful to to be part of uh, this journal club. You know, I love I love research and behavior analysis like everybody here. Um, yeah, just in general, to, you know, to get it a, um, out of the way. A lot of my work you can see at uh, behaviorfit.com. I'm on active on most social media platforms on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. You can follow me there. And I have a podcast called Behavior Fit Radio where you get to hear from you know, me directly just kind of uh, freestyling on just different ideas of applied behavior analysis, um, health and fitness. So um, that's kind of where you can find my work. And really, it's about, um, you know, I, I came to a point in my career really after my master's program. You'll see the timeline um, later here today when I when I share my slides is that I had all this information and knowledge that was new and different. And I like to be creative and share different ways to um, get into, you know, disseminating behavior analysis, not only within the field, but externally. So I created those platforms and I, I kind of go through my story here today. And um, yeah, hopefully, you know, some, something here will be valuable that can maybe inspire, motivate you to, uh, you know, maybe get into health and fitness or do something new and uh, unique. So um, yeah, so I'll go ahead and jump into my presentation. It just as a little, um, just as a, a preview here for my presentation, you know, I thought about, you know, what do I want to talk about? How much of the research and practice? It's going to be a combination of both. So I'm going to get into my story. So then each of you can kind of get, you know, get a good gauge of, you know, the research in my body of work and let you kind of be, you know, the judge of my own work. So um, just, I'm just curious. So I'm coming from, uh, from across the pond in the United States in Indianapolis, Indiana. If I could have maybe like 10 or 15 people respond in the chat there. Is everybody here in the UK? If not, maybe just share where you are. Um, if it's UK, you could say close to the Tizard Center. I mean, I just want to get a feel if you could just... Uh, Poland, okay, cool. Poland, Switzerland, wow, okay. Croatia, I'm glad I asked. So this is an international um, 
an international crowd. Toronto, Ecuador, thank you, Susie, Marlene, the Netherlands, Japan. Wow, so we are all navigating the time zone. So I am Eastern Time, U.S., Germany, Canterbury. See, look at that. I learned so much. new. Thank you, everybody, uh, for uh, joining. I, I want to say that this is us uh, flexing now, um, Nick, with your question. You, you, you gave us a good opportunity to flex on how international that these are. Yeah. <laughs> the, Thanks the, for that. The, the behavior <laughs> Change Club, the, the Behavior Journal Club, reaches far and wide. Bristol, U.K., London. Thailand. Wow, this is this is probably the most in, internationally diverse uh, audience I've ever spoken to. Um, so uh, this is this is great. So all right, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen. All right, window. Go here and now hit play. All right. So um, yeah, Thanos. Whenever you see a question or you need to interrupt, just let me know. I'm just seeing full screen version here. Um, so. Uh, so for me here today, I just, you know, uh, my, kind of my title of my talk is, you know, health and fitness as an applied subject matter. So most people um, come into the field in a, you know, kind of a developmental disability application. Um, but for me, I kind hey, of found my way in, in health so, and fitness. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you might be sharing the um, notes, not the full screen. Oh, OK. Let me, let me check here one more time. Just to make Swipe. sure that we brought that up to full screen so people can easily see it. All right, let me let me see here. Let me thank you for the interruption there. OK, let me go here. Expand. Swipe left. Now I will play. All right. Um, All right, let me see. For some reason, I'm having trouble with when I hit well, the play. It's not, it's not the end of the world. We can't see the slides. It's just that they are not in the presenter mode. They are like you're just scrolling uh, okay. PowerPoint. Not the end of the world. I just thought I'd bring yeah. it up just in case it was easy. But if not, just take but it along. I'm going to go with screen. There we go. We'll go screen here. That's what we'll do. All right. Can you see it now? Yep. It's all good. There we go. Okay. I just went screen. Yeah. Um, okay, so thank you to everybody at the Tizard Center, University of Kent. So um, I really appreciate being able to share my knowledge here at the international level. So like I kind of uh, mentioned before, I'm going to share my journey and background so you get to know me a little bit. I'll discuss health and fitness as a subject matter, and I'll talk about some lessons learned from research and practice um, about helping people get healthier and fit. So it's important for me to really help you um, just kind of share my story so you can you know, share your, you know, make your own opinion about, you know, my my story here, and it gives context to my lessons learned, and you kind of pick out, you know, the themes along the way. So um, this is about me here. So my story, I went to Purdue University, which is in Indianapolis, Indiana, USA, and it is a, you know, basic liberal arts engineering school. We sent, uh, we sent uh, Neil Armstrong to the moon. Um, my first job out of college was as a, as a uh, mental health uh, kind of support person, where I was doing a lot of paperwork at this mental health center. Had no ABA background at all, um, but uh, got my feet wet just being in the industry there. But that wasn't really fruitful, so I kind of moved on. I had a brief stint in a photography studio where I got to work on my sales and presentation skills at a very, very uh, basic level. And then I actually found myself at a at a gym. So this is a picture of me. I'm actually in the uh, and this is the grand opening of a of a facility. I'm in the lower right hand corner there. So that was really how I just. Start. I started being introduced to the health and fitness space in the real world after college. Um, after doing some sales work there, I got kind of bored, and a friend of mine became a uh, what we call as a just a regular ABA kind of behavior therapist. This was back in 20 or 2009, so well over 10 years ago, and this was before the RBT credential um, was out. So I worked clinically for about four and a half, five years with uh, youth and adolescents. Um, uh, with, uh, you know, challenging behaviors. I really enjoyed, you know, the older kids, you know, from 12 to 18. But along the way, I discovered that there's this whole science um, com called behavior analysis. And specifically, I was interested in organizational behavior management. And so I found myself, I moved to Florida with my girlfriend at the time. She's my now wife. Um, I attended the Florida Institute of Technology, uh, Melbourne campus in Melbourne, Florida, um, so I enjoyed myself there. Got a, my uh, two-year master's degree at Florida Tech, and you'll see how the research and practice kind of, um, you know, 
you know, played itself out. And then I found an opportunity to work with my advisor um, there, Jesse Daller in the light, where I got my PhD in behavior analysis um, in the psychology program there at the University of Florida. So spent a good six years in good old sunny Florida. And so that's kind of uh, that's kind of my history, how I got into the field. Um, but along the way, I kind of found myself, I had a little bit of a dilemma, right? I was identifying as a behavior analyst, I passed the exam, but at the same time as a PhD student, I was a student, and then being in the public health space, I was a health educator, practitioner, all these titles, right? All these different things that um, you're not just a behavior analyst, you, you have to wear these multiple hats, right? So um, the difference for me was I wanted to help others improve their health and fitness, but um, there was a there was a, there was a problem, right? So for me, the circumstances were right. The context, my story, is I was on campus, full time student, full time PhD student. I um, was full time in, in courses and in, in conducting research, and I was still gaining my experience, really my expertise in the whole health and fitness arena. You know, uh, starting six eight years ago. So those are my circumstances. I wanted to help people, and so what I needed to do, thinking about how can I apply my OBM skill set to my needs where I needed to cre create a sustainable model that made sense for me and how I wanted to just slowly um, grow my experience and interest. And so what that looked like, as I mentioned, as I started the recording, I started a blog, shared my basic my basic understanding of what I knew at the time. Eventually, then I started to get into more social media and marketing, you know, when it comes to behavior fit and health and fitness and, uh, and applying the science there. Then I started working on workshops and uh, developed coaching models, started taking on clients, and then began along the way. I've mentored some younger professionals, younger behavior analysts along the way who are interested in um, doing a little bit of what I do. So that was kind of my story leading up to, um, uh, you know, here today, really. So everything kind of builds on each other. So over time, then, I began developing my own interest in health and fitness as a subject matter. And I, I don't have a slide for this, but really it came to a point where as a as a grad student at Florida Tech, I needed to make a personal change for my own health and fitness, and I didn't know what to do, and I got into some functional training, and that kind of coalesced with this research that I'll talk about, and so everything kind of worked together, so for me, it became easy to add a personal interest. I was personally invested. I needed a research topic for a thesis, and so I um, just, that was really kind of the impetus of me developing my expertise and, um, you know, the beginning of my, my body of work so far. <clears throat> so when we look at um, yeah, any kind of body type out there, any image, when we think about health and wellness and fitness, we, we see different different ethnic backgrounds. We have different uh, different activities we engage in all the time, whether it's weightlifting in the top in the top right or just general activity in the bottom right or just kind of being leisurely. Right. We have ideas of of what health and wellness fitness may look like. Right. We could be vacationing, surfing with our dog on the surfboard. Right. <clears throat> Depending where you are. But at the end of the day. We all know that health comes down to behavior, right? All things being equal, we're humans, we have the DNA, so when in, when environmental variables affect us, right, our, our bodies will respond a certain way, right? So we always know that health is going to be um, a result of our behavior. So when I wear my OBM hat, I also think about how health is the you know ultimate storm, uh, scorecard. So really the question is, what does your health say about these these indicators? So in OBM business jargon, we have a combination of like a leading indicator and a lagging indicator. A, 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 a lagging or a leading indicator might be something that tells us our behavior that we're tracking in the right direction. And a lagging indicator will be something that um, as a result of all those behaviors, this is kind of the result, right? So when it comes to health and fitness, we think about weekly exercise. That's going to tell us that we're heading in the right direction. And the lagging indicator would be uh, a resting heart rate. So we know if we if we have a high resting heart rate and we exercise a lot over time with the right measures and environmental uh, interventions in place, our resting heart rate um, may go down a little bit, you know, trend trend in the right direction. So we think about our health at any point in time, but our health today right now is going to be the result of the choices that we made in the past, right? What we made in the past 24 hours, week, month, year, decade. Um, in the United States here, we just had our Thanksgiving holiday. So there's always the Turkey and stuffing and all those festivities where we're all out and about for a couple of days uh, on vacation, eating a lot, right? Watching American football, um, right? The, the, the National Football League. Um, I know we are I, speaking to an international crowd. I know 
the real football is the Premier League, La Liga, you know, things like that. Um, but uh, right, so we see all those choices, those those health, uh, those those environmental events are going to affect our health, right, over over the years. So, so just a question for the audience here. So, what are some behaviors that are related to health and fitness? If you could go ahead and respond to the chat, I'll go ahead and back out so I can see your answers. Ooh, back over here. All right, so I'm looking in the chat here. So go ahead and can you label, can you name a few behaviors that are related to health and fitness? Physical activity, both exercise and being sedentary. Good. Thank you, Sarah. Finding time to swim. That's a good, yeah. The planning stage of a, a precursor behavior, finding time to swim. You have to plan to go to the swimming pool. Consistency, right? So showing up every day, Jason. Thank you. Uh, an eating schedule. Yep. So eating at specific times of day. That's a, an important behavior. Um, avoidance. Maybe you can expand upon that. Sleep, right? So uh, sleep is that behavior. Does that pass the dead man's test? Sleep. Am I actively engaged in something? Um, there's a lot of conversations to have around that. Following a plan. Good. Really compliance with the protocol. Good. Elizabeth. Persistence. Good. Thank you. Uh, and recovery. Yeah. So there's a lot that goes into right those general pieces with um, uh, with uh, with recovery. So thank you um, there. So, you know, we think about objective targets here, right? Food, we kind of hit on some of those. So consuming four vegetables, having an eating schedule, drinking 64 ounces of water, right? something objective and measurable that we can have, um, that we can observe in the environment. Decreasing sugar intake, that was a, that was a target that I, that I um, worked on with uh, one client. When it comes to exercise, we uh, we hit on some of these here, going to the pool, right? So going to the gym three days a week, going to the swimming pool three days a week, elevating heart rate to a target, right? We know in the exercise research that hitting um, a certain level of vigorous activity is beneficial uh, if we hit it so many minutes per week. Um, step counts are very popular, so increasing total um, daily steps. So we kind of we hit on a bunch of those there. So um, just a question now for any for, 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 for the crowd again. So do you incorporate any healthy behavior change in your research, if if you have a research study going on, or practice, and if so, what are your targets? So the question here: Do you incorporate any healthy behavior change strategies in your research or practice? And go ahead and let me know in the chat. Tracking exercise. So anybody working on anything with any clients or any of their work that they're doing um, today? That's okay if there are none. Um, water intake, good. Mindfulness, portion control, all very good targets. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sarah says tolerating new healthful foods. Yeah, uh, yeah. Food selectivity, uh, food, um, yeah, uh, uh, food consumption, uh, always a big um, a challenge for folks that are have developmental disabilities and have um, you know very. Narrow reinforcers, port, stimulus equivalents for portion sizes. Very good. Yeah, thank you. Those are all very good answers for uh, for this question. So uh, a lot of strategies go involved. It takes time, right? These aren't going to happen overnight. I work with typically developing adults, and so the same uh, uh, you know the same challenge as far as how long it takes to change behavior um, is also um, you know, apparent with uh, young learners with any developmental disability. So. Uh, people often say, right, so during assessment, this is getting back to my practice here, is that, right, some, something very general, I want to get fit, I want to lose weight, right, here comes the new year, I want to lose more weight, and I want to sleep better, right, sleep was, a, sleep was an answer. So really my job as a behavior analyst is to unpack, right, be more specific, become more objective with these kind of general statements, and, uh, and, and understand which behaviors and results are going to align with the client's needs, wants, and outcomes. So behaviors and the results, right? I want to lose weight. So what behaviors is going to result in losing weight? Is it going to be eating uh, a certain amount of calories per day over the next six months that's going to re yield you know, a 10-pound weight loss? Is it going to be omitting certain foods from your diet that's going to result in a, a desired weight change? And so the, the second piece here, aligning with the client's needs, that, sh that should probably be uh, you know, stressed a little bit. So for me as a researcher, as a behavior analyst, I have, you know, a certain level of knowledge about the research, you know, what comes to the, uh, behavior change strategies and the health and, health and fitness literature that 
I may know what is a desirable direction to go, but if the client doesn't wish for that result or behavior change, then um, it doesn't make sense to target it. So it's always, as a coach, it's always challenging to, you know, withhold my bias, check my bias. Like I know the research, but if you don't want to go there, it's not for me to say that I want that I should push you in that direction, right? So um, these are things that come up in the assessment uh, process. So for health and fitness, as as a uh, as a target area, right? So the meaningful change required pinpointing, right? That's an organizational behavior management term. We want to be specific about those health and fitness behaviors and those results, right? It, uh, right. There's different ways to achieve a result. You can lose weight by systematically maybe decreasing your calories, or you could also lose the same amount of weight if you just starve yourself for two days, right? So do those behavior and results results make sense, right? There's always a way to um, to think about doing things right the right way for for the client. Um, and it's also important to remember that behavior is the means to the end, right? So it's not. Uh, there's no mentalistic interpretation. There's no magic willpower. There's no just surprise, hey, I'm fit, or hey, su surprise, I sleep better. Like We can really look into the environment of, and see how the behavior and the environment met together to achieve that health and fitness um, result. When it comes to labels, there's nothing really inherent about health or fitness. It's These are just kind of category labels we, we give, so we want to remember that when we think about our uh, you know, our pragmatic thinking and really health and fitness. If you think of things on a spectrum, they're likely to describe behavior or states of, of wellness. So there is no, like all of a sudden I'm in good health or bad health. There's really kind of just rates of behavior and there's no in shape versus out of shape. I'm on a continuum that I can achieve certain behaviors or results. It isn't that maybe one day I have a 150 pound bench press and all of a sudden, all of a sudden I'm in shape. Well, unless you have something objectively defined that as a whole category, but in general, Right. There's no magic, uh, you know, ta-da, I'm out of shape or ta-da, I'm in shape. Right. So we think about that because oftentimes in health and fitness, uh, those labels kind of creep in and it takes us away from being, you know, as objective as we as we need to be. So, so when I think about there, Nick, sorry to interrupt yep. and say our first mm -hmm. keyword is magic. Our first keyword is magic. First, magic. There is no magic in health and fitness. It's all about the behaviors and results, magic, magic, magic. That was that was a perfect uh, perfect keyword for that part of the presentation. Well played, Thanos. Um, so, yes. so, behaviors and results. I really think about these as a range of um, just. Oops, keep going back. My my apologies. As a range of response probabilities, right? We know that when we're looking at the the data in the lab, right? We have a low probability of health and fitness behavior, and we have a high probability of health and fitness behavior. So. How do we know Nick is super fit? Not because of a label, but because under various environmental conditions, he has a high probability of going to the gym. How do we know that Nick is not fit or doesn't care about fitness? He is on the couch seven days a week for the past five years, right? It's all a range of these probabilities. And when we think about health outcomes, we think about the health risks that are involved. So we have a low risk of poor health outcomes or a high risk of poor health outcomes, right? There's a high risk of smoking cigarettes all the time for getting lung cancer. But there are some outliers that never get lung cancer. But just in general, there's going to be a high risk and a low risk for poor health outcomes. If you're in shape, moving well, um, you're at a lower risk for heart disease, right? So I think about those, how the behaviors and risks kind of align and, and play together there. So when I when I think about, um, actually, before I get into my lessons learned, any, any questions here um, of anything that I've... Uh, I've discussed so far. Um, I kind of went a little didactic there. Just want to pause here. If anybody has any questions on any of my material or background, I'll take a minute. Going once, going twice, waiting for the long international typing. No, okay. All right. Thanos, feel free to interrupt if one comes in. So my lessons learned here. So. My training in behavior analysis and expertise kind of prepared me for the unknown. And this is where we kind of get into the thick of um, uh, my, my research and everything um, in preparation for today. So we've seen these articles. Um, if you haven't, there's um, go ahead and look at Java, Behavior Analysis, Research and Practice, and the board here. There's a board paper um, on the right. So there's uh, Dr. Matt Norman out of the Uni University of Pacific. He's done a, a nice job over the, I'd say, the past 10 years of just kind of outlying, 
outlining what uh, what health coaching certifications are out there that could be helpful for people. Um, and uh, there's a white paper here by the BACB that, that say, hey, we can do health and fitness. How do we do it? But if you notice here um, that the recommended reading um, is uh, Dallary and Norman. So there isn't a lot, uh, but the articles are there. So the challenge is how do we how do we make that uh, how do we make this practice, you know, come come to light? So, again, just to kind of review um, where I kind of went through, you know, in, a, in a more of a chronological timeline, you'll see how my expertise built um, kind of over time. So August 13, that seems so strange being almost in 2020. This was nearly eight years ago. I started my master's degree, graduated, started at UF as a PhD student. I actually attended a conference on sedentary behavior. So it was a conference all about sitting, which actually – uh, was a good uh, kind of double dip for that was my first blog that I published for um, Behavior Fit. So those are my top 15 things I learned about a conference about sitting. So it was heavy on the research, all about physical activity and, and exercise researchers. Um, and actually, the the sedentary behavior um, literature, a large portion of it comes out of the UK uh, research and um, Scandinavian countries, as well as in Australia. That's where the predominant researchers are in the space. So if anybody here is interested in this research, you're pretty close to um, those those international leaders. So um, in fall of 16, I got into more of workplace wellness. That's what the uh, the topic of my research is, right? So reducing the sitting in the workplace. So I became involved uh, through that uh, through that uh, through that course. I met an instructor that introduced me to the wellness team on campus, and then I found out there is a there's actually a, a consortium called Building Healthy Academic Communities here. Um, in the United States that looks at building wellness programs for uh, college campuses. And I was able to present my research there. Um, you've seen that poster. And that was um, looking at the poster. That's going to be some slides that I'll show here um, in a little bit. So um, nice, nice coincidence there. Um, but for me, my systems thinking, my OBM acumen applied to health and fitness, you know, started early and is led to where I am today. So then, but over time, um, I, I was interested in other facets of of health and fitness, I, uh, I I completed probably about a 20-hour um, movement mobility course that really helped you understand being in a good position, rotating shoulders, right? Um, you know where your neck should be when it comes to weightlifting and things like that. So that was a fun course. Um, I started working with my first client there in fall of 17. I took a, a certification course in CrossFit. That's my flavor of fitness that I enjoy. Um, so that was a whole weekend, two day course where I learned, um, really learned what the coaches learn at that basic level course. That was very uh, fruitful. And that kind of speaks to what, um, you know, those Norman and Dallary articles are, are talking about when it comes to health coaching. So you want to, you know, get those extra certifications under your belt so that you know, right, you know what the other industry leaders know in the field and you can brush up on your skills as well. Um, then after I graduated, I got an adjunct appointment to help with wellness programs at the, uh, at the College of Public Health and Health Professions. So everything kind of uh, kind of fit into each other. And so uh, for me, I think it's important that we talk about for, you know, in this group here is that you know, this is a training that goes beyond the ABA classroom, right? We know that most of the content, if you think about it that way, and that's how I kind of think now, the content that goes along with the coursework has education, special education, developmental, developmental disabilities, all embedded into the, the program already. Um, kind of just by default. So it takes a little bit extra to go ahead and, and look for like an OBM course or a program or look for applications in behavior-based safety or, or health and fitness. Um, and so because it's not a part of the meat of the coursework, you have to, um, at this point in the way the ABA practice is, you have to kind of find your, your niche area kind of like this, how I, how I kind of did. So um, the progress so far, just check my time, looking good. Uh, this is my, you know, my academic training um, and then I got my uh, kind of certificates and I have a sports background, too. So it all kind of it helps uh, just kind of married my, my interest and passions together to kind of lead to uh, developing my research and, and my practice. So um, the interesting thing here is that for my subject matter expertise, my research always really fit for pandemic life. What happened in pandemic life? Well, we all were first indoors. Different countries have different rules now. We have travel bans. We don't have travel bans. All these things are happening, right? I, interestingly enough, I was working actually with a, a client of mine who, we started working together I think in the middle of the summer of 2020, and she was in the UK outside of London. So I was 
we're all navigating the pandemic together, but it was interesting to learn like my state and, and country rules when it comes to the pandemic rules and then what was happening um, in London at the time when it comes to the pandemic and, and, and uh, shutdowns and everything. So, uh, right, the UK would have tighter bands when a variant out, you know, outbreak was happening and parts of the US just didn't care. But at the core of it is how much activity we're getting because all these environmental variables will um, affect our sedentary behavior. And when we look at the, the literature, the definition, um, you can see me, I'm standing at my desk right now. So sedentary behavior is any anytime you're awake, any waking activity characterized by energy expenditure, less than or equal to one or five metabolic equivalents. You just think of that as, as just calories burned in a sitting or reclining posture. So sitting, <clears throat> excuse me, so sitting or lying down. So by definition, I am not uh, sedentary, I'm standing. So what happened during the pandemic, we have the literature now to, to, to support this, is that physical activity decreased, sedentary behavior increased. Sometimes they're mutually exclusive, sometimes they're not. And we do know that childhood obesity increased as well. So um, common sense, right, these ideas, but we do have the data to support that, you know, pockets, demographics of, you know, of, of us, we, uh, we're trending in the wrong direction, right? So um, it's important to know that sedentary activity is different than other activities. So if we look at, you know, a pie chart of our 16 uh, waking hours here, assuming that we get like eight hours of sleep, uh, we know that sedentary time actually is a large portion, 70% of the day. Light intensity ex uh, movement, physical activity is, you know, dishes, putting clothes on, walking down the street. And even for the people that do exercise, on average, you're only exercising really, you know, 30 minutes a day, right, based on right, heart rate activity. So sedentary activity, a large chunk of the day. So the problem is, right, well, what's the problem with sitting? If you think about it, it really goes against everything that we're built to do. So anything that we are, uh, you know, we're meant to move, jump, skip, pop, run, pull, push, all these things, right? So if we're not doing those things, then, right, loosely speaking, we're getting, you know, we're getting weaker, we're getting important, you know, we're in bad positions. If we're in a, if we're tapping in a computer all day like this, we're getting hunched over, we're not in good positions, right? Things like that. So our body's made for movement, and if you don't move it enough, right, we have the bad things that happen. So on a typical day, we may we may drive to work, right? We may get some activity, at some light activity at, at the computer, we do some computer work. We go out with friends for lunch, but we're still sedentary. We might get some spontaneous activity on the streets, but not maybe not every day. We go outside, we have a, we have a pint with colleagues after work, still sedentary, um, and we go home to sedentary reinforcers, right? So the problem is that this repeats on and on, and it's a it's a it's a part of many of our lives today, right? So, what the interesting thing here is what happened during the pandemic is that it engineered what I say is kind of natural physical activity out of our lives. So, um, these buckets, right? We did have some transitions, right? So, some of us went from working in an office to working at home. Now we we could be a part of some hybrid model. Any of those cases were removing. Right, the walk to the car, walk to the parking lot, walking to the tube, right? These things, walking to to and from the restaurant. So I even noticed when I was uh, forced in indoors for, you know, whatever time that was for a couple months, that you didn't have those many as many transitions. So that little activity that we got to begin with was was removed. So um, you may be thinking to yourself, I, I exercise. That's good enough, right? Well, you have to exercise a lot for it to protect against regular sitting. And I'll I'll show you what I mean here. So. This is a, a somewhat complicated looking graph, but hopefully if I, if I do a good job, you'll be able to, to interpret it to your friend. So we have three axes here that we need to, um, that we need to, to discuss. So we have um, the risk of death on the y-axis. Um, I'm looking for my mouse here, but it doesn't appear that I can pull it up. That's okay. So you see the green bar is, that corresponds to 300 minutes of physical activity per week. So that's shorter. And then if you have the red bar is zero minutes of activity, but then as that gets bigger, you see the risk of death increases here. Um, I'm actually going to, I don't like the way that's happening. So I'm going to just skip here and use my cursor. So, and then on the, this X axis here, we see how much we sit. So if we don't sit very much, but exercise a lot, 
we see have the lowest risk, right? Remember what I said earlier about the general um, risk categories. But now the issue is whenever we go ahead and increase the amount of sitting, this relationship maintains um, throughout throughout the uh, throughout the, uh, the for those combinations, right? So as sitting time increases, that risk of death on the y-axis. I know it's kind of morbid, but that's how they do the research. They count up how many people are alive at the end of these studies. So you see, uh, depending on which category you're in here, I'm going to back out again, is that you have, right, if you exercise 300 minutes and you sit a lot, your risk is going to be higher here. So you just see here that that relationship increases. So the question here that you have to ask yourself, right, depending on which category you're in now, do you want to change categories? So you have to ask, do you um, sit about eight hours a day? How much exercise do you get? Are you in the red bars, the green bars? And really, it's just about you know, risk management, right? These are all risk categories. But for most people, these are the kind of the, the risks involved with a sedentary behavior. So from the research, the main point, again, this is where this is the... Um, uh, a lot of the work I had to do for, you know, the rationale, the social validity of of my research agenda is that even if you exercise, meet the exercise guidelines, your risk of various diseases and cancers increase. So the more you sit, the more you're, the greater your risk for preventable disease. So there's other there's other articles too that discuss how breaking up the amount of sitting throughout the day is also important, right? So sitting for uh, for 40 minutes and then taking a quick little break. Um, as opposed to sitting for like three hour chunks, right? The shorter that average sedentary bout, the better the health outcome. So that kind of fueled a lot of the the recommendations and everything in the literature. So there's kind of two there's kind of two two paths to success here for improving health outcomes. You can increase your exercise time or reduce your sitting time, right? And so what's what was interesting that happened here during the pandemic is that it challenged both recommendations. So um, the challenge for the exercise time is that, uh, the, the availability of places to go work out was reduced dramatically. You know, once gyms figured out how to navigate the space with social distancing, things like that. My gym even shut down for about six to eight weeks. Then when it opened back up, we had new protocols. So all of these variables affected how much exercise we, we could engage in, right? And then reduce, um, you could reduce daily sitting time. We know that sitting time increased as we were forced indoors and we couldn't, we couldn't do much, right? Um, so for this, this is a great time as we have been here for a good 30, 40 minutes. So go ahead. We're going to take a 30 to 60 movement break. So go ahead and um, stand, stretch for a good 30 seconds. A good stretch here. Um, if we're at the computer, we kind of reach for the sky, rotate our armpits forward. You can just kind of shake it out. I've been standing for a little bit. I'm going to shake it out here. So if do please play at home, um, go ahead, stand up and stretch. And this is what kind of gets at the research of how it uh, is important to move and do um, different things, right? Um, and also, to point out, it is a little bit awkward um, to do this in the middle of your workspace or um, wherever you are in your computer. You might not have the availability to just get up and freely move around, right? These are legitimate, you know, barriers to research, barriers to practice. I have a full-time desk job, and sometimes I find it difficult, even though I know the research. So, um, well, you, you've certainly scared me into standing up. <laughs> yeah, that's that's sometimes a uh, a. Uh, I'm glad you said that, Donna. Sometimes when I, I presented in person in the past, I had one guy who's a he's a funny presenter. He would just stand up right away. He's like, "Okay, I'm up. I'm standing up." Yeah, uh, <laughs> I can imagine you scaring the room when you're yes. delivering presentations in conferences and getting everybody to stand up. Can yeah, I just say that our second keyword is sitting? Our second keyword for your CEUs is sitting. Thanks, or should we, or should we make it standing or moving? No, oh, sitting's fine. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's, it's something too. So when I start educating others about, you know, I'm the educator. I'm a public health educator, right? That's the hat I'm wearing now. Is that it isn't about sitting. It isn't about standing. So some people will say, well, how much should I stand? It's just about general movement, right? So if we, you know, stand for a little bit, um, you know, prior to this talk, I was actually sitting for about you know, an hour, hour and a half, and then I'm now standing for this. And after this presentation, I will go ahead and sit some more because your legs get tired. They need to move. They need to relax. So 
um, the movement the movement breaks. So through the years, there have been a uh, just a, a combination of different recommendations. Um, not objective by our standard, right? The, the Health and Human Services recommendation here in the United States is sit less and move more. Well, that doesn't give us much to go from, but you saw in my, my research articles that I try to be more objective in the measurement, how we go about um, actually measuring that. So um, uh, office workers, you know, the, the general goal is to reduce, you know, sitting time, right? The, the, the studies there discuss, right, the average the average office worker is sitting 12 to 14 hours, and if they reduce it by two a day, they can get there, right? Moving every 30 minutes, you have combinations of, uh, uh, right, every uh, one minute, every 30 minutes, every 60 minutes, a combination of public health research, there's some ergonomics literature in here, um, and some general behavioral, uh, behavior change um, recommendations too. So it's around these, uh, these recommendations I was able to drive a lot of my, my research um, articles off of. So in preparation for um, this meeting, even though I thought everybody was going to be from the UK, but we have an international audience, so I encourage everybody to look at their uh, national um, health guidelines. But in the UK, for the chief medical officer, they have this uh, physical activity and older adults uh, uh, poster that I saw. So this is published right before the pandemic. As that you see here, again, very vague, but still there to minimize sedentary time and break up periods of inactivity. So whatever that looks like for you, um, again, there, there will obviously have to be some assessment involved, but as a general guideline, if you could minimize a little bit, right, if you sit all day at an eight, eight hour job, if you get up and move once every hour for a minute, that's a whole eight minutes of activity, but breaking it is the important part. So again, here in the UK, Chief Medical Officer, they are all, uh, all on board there. So um, looks like my timing is fairly good here. Um, so if the research on sedentary behavior over the years has has been measured with a couple different devices. Um, they've they've looked at this Actigraph, which I which was the red device there that was in my my research article. The Active Pal, that is a device that actually sticks on your leg for seven days, and I didn't. Uh, it doesn't. That's not well suited for single case design. That's more for uh, large uh, large group studies, group designs. So. Um, I opted against that strategy, so I used the active pal for that first study. And oftentimes there's some type of workforce, uh, work environment manipulation, so you get exercise machines like these little peddlers. Uh, there you have sit-stand desks, very popular, right? I have my adjustable one that goes up and down like this. Um, there's different interventions. There's a software package called like ExerTime. That's just an example. But oftentimes all of these uh, these studies will have action plans, self-management strategies, texting, coaching, all these things, basically the the, the intervention groups get, gets everything in the kitchen sink and then the control group gets nothing. And then they say, oh, this was good. Now we need to tease out X, Y, and Z. So really, as I got into the literature, I understood that the we didn't really know how effective each of these components were right, right, alone, together, combined. That's, that was really kind of the theme of my, my research there. So in the first, the first study, um, was my master's thesis, decreasing bouts of prolonged sitting in Java. So I use an actigraph and a watch minder, and I use those key intervention components of the prompting, feedback, and goal setting. Um, so this uh, this um, this slide here shows the actigraph, right? So that was the um, in the bottom right, the uh, elastic strap with the red uh, actigraph on it. Actually goes around the waist, and then the participant was uh, instructed to wear it just on outside of their hip. And the Watchminder 3, which was a very old school device there in the middle, that's me wearing it. You could actually, it, it vibrated, it had to be charged. Um, I programmed, to say, programmed it to say, to stay, to say stand. Um, so you have a couple different devices there. Um, it's kind of funny, I dug up this old slide um, from when I presented these data uh, a few years ago that back in 2014, before the record, you know, nowadays app, the, Apple Watch, the Apple Watch is so common, we have so many different versions, right? I submitted my thesis to the IRB before the announcement of the Apple Watch where you have, right, what's, what do we see now in the Apple Watch? So you have these stand rings and it says there's prompting there. So I just pretty much kind of threw my hands up. I was just like, what are the odds? I was trying to cobble together the technology and then Apple comes along and just makes the watch and, you know, now the rest is history, right? I, I can even look on, I can look on my rings right now. I can see, right, my green ring. I am 9 out of 12, right? I'm almost there. So I've been up. Uh, you know, since since 5 a.m. this morning. So 
uh, I submitted it there. So a good face validity, you know, there for that. So, uh, you know, in the article, all of us read it here today. We saw the lowest levels at the end of the study. So there's still, right, there's all kinds of manipulations that we could do in future studies. We could, you know, run out the phases a little longer. Um, we could introduce prompting feedback and goal setting earlier. We could use an Apple Watch nowadays, right? Uh, but the, the the assessment that I made, you know, for two out of three participants, uh, consequence-based interventions, right, the feedback and goal setting uh, produced lower levels than the antecedent-based um, interventions. Um, and, uh, right, this was a, this was a, uh, you know, four-phase study, right, A, B, um, C, and then D phase. So there's a lot of rooms for just all kinds of ideas for, for research, but uh, um, the secret is I had to graduate, so we couldn't really run any more phases. That's sometimes how, how studies end up, uh, how they end. But um, so that was, that was that study. Anybody have any questions on, um, on, this, uh, on this article? Let me flip over here to the, uh, yeah, Donald said any questions, pop them in the chat. Um, pause over here. Any questions on that first study? Anything about the methods? The results. Nobody's itching. Okay. All right. I, I love I love the fact that the the reason behind why you needed to step the face changes that is uh, you know um, it goes to show what happens with research sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we've got a question that says, what were the antecedent and consequence uh, based interventions there? If you could talk a bit more about them. Oh, sure. Yeah. So it says right there in the phase. So we have, um, right. So the orange, oh, shoot, my cursor went away. Sorry, I keep flipping back and forth here. Um, so the orange for antecedent, so information. So that was just, um, here's what you need to do for the study, right? And then the tactile prompt. So again, antecedent based, the prompt then uh, was on an interval schedule. So then before that, uh, you know, so it prompted you to engage in the, uh, to move, right? So uh, to get up and move around a little bit. Um, and the consequence was feedback and goal setting. So then I uh, sent a, an email describing uh, their their bouts, right? So antecedent information. So really the information was delivered, right? Once at the beginning of the phase and the tactical prompting was, um, yeah. Nick, so that would have been- Could, I, could I ask what goal setting procedure you used? Do you remember? So the goal, yeah, <laughs> so being seven years ago. So it was just really basic of looking at um, looking at the number of bouts, and then you can see on the um, the levels here. We saw we saw. Um, so if we take Pat here, so say the average was seven bouts of sitting, um, or number of bouts of sitting greater than 30 minutes. So so we say now the the goal will be to set. It was participative uh, goal setting. So we said what would be a good number of uh, bouts for you to have for this next phase, and so um, and it needs to be less than. Um, the average of the previous phase, which, which was seven. So it went something like that. Does that make sense? Yeah, gotcha. So yeah. If, if I'm looking at your design there, did you embed then a change in criterion design in a multiple baseline design, and you also have four different conditions? Is that what uh, I'm looking at? No, not here. So these were actually just the mean lines um, as as described in the, uh, the, the Java figure. Um, so these are just the, the mean line just for ease of analysis. Here I added those, yeah. But yeah, it does kind of look almost like a changing criteria design. That's correct. We've ha we have a question on this. That's why I'm asking. It says, what is the most oh. common studies design you're using in your um, work? Oh, yeah. So in my work, so, uh, you know, in my graduate studies there, so I only had, uh, I did three studies. Um, I didn't publish the third one, um, but it was a combination of looking at um, what I learned through the process, again, through me becoming educated just on all these different areas, right, of of public health because it's it's kind of complicated when you get down to the, the research but um, I realized that then in the next study I think that's kind of a good segue that I combined the education information um, as part of the instructions to begin with and then I think altering like feedback and goal setting plus a change in criterion design um, would be probably most uh, beneficial um, for like future research um, so so if we look at the second study I'll just stay here so it doesn't, uh, so I can use my mouse here. So then the second study kind of, uh, I combined the education and feedback and task clarification. So I can just jump to, yeah, here. So then we can see we had an education phase, then we got into feedback, and then we got into task clarification um, as far as like how many steps. So I found that 
the task clarification phase was necessary. Again, this was kind of an iterative researcher learning process, right? Of I wasn't specific about I'm saying like, hey, you need to move every 30 minutes, but then I didn't say, oh yeah, you need to take at least 100 steps for each um, during each break. And so I added that phase in there, um, and then these were the the data here. So uh, somebody like the second participant, we saw that the feedback phase was more than enough. She was the exemplar performer, um, so she never needed to go to the task clarification. So she so we could say maybe behaviorally that she was very rule governed followed instructions quite well, and this was a meaningful, you know, behavior for her to target, whereas other participants, um, feedback alone in that rule wasn't as, uh, wasn't as effective. Um, but getting back here, just, uh, just to add a little bit more to this uh, presentation that you didn't get into, that you wouldn't see in, in the article, um, is that if you get on the Fitbit dashboard, again, you can kind of replay this recording later, but you, you see a display like this, these are 15-minute um, histograms, and I would add those together with help of, with help of research assistant to then calculate uh, the dependent variable, which is the percentage of active bouts per workday. So you have active over active plus inactive. So based on their reported work shift, so I used office workers, right? Um, and just as another check of uh, there's another face validity update where just like the Apple Watch, Fitbit also gave an update that said, hey. If you're a Fitbit user and you have this app, you need to get moving every hour. So I'm giving them the instructions to move every 100 steps. And then Fitbit comes out and gives this other 250 step recommendation in the app. But they were never guided to use the app. So whether or not they accessed it, I didn't track that. But um, it was interesting to see how I was learning about the research. And then tech companies who are selling products are starting to embed th this research, which is all good. Um, but it, uh, potentially was, well, I would say it was potentially, but it was kind of inconvenient for me when I'm trying to conduct some clear phases, if that makes sense. So, um, and if you had the Fitbit app, I'm pretty sure it looks similar to this nowadays, that you would get these little dots saying how active you were if you if you took 250 steps, and that feedback is way more beautiful than my, you know, email from an Outlook email account, you know, with a screenshot. So, uh, way to go Fitbit. I give them props for that. So, um, Getting to you know, just a couple other things here, you know, just in the, in the interest of time, um, my 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 feedback here, right? So was uh, just a really kind of generic kind of graph that I made them of uh, what your performance was if you moved every 60 minutes, if you moved every 30 minutes, this is what your your bar would look like. And so just please do your best every day to walk, you know, 100 steps every 30 minutes. So um, I said 100 every 30 minutes, right? Fitbit says 250 every 60 minutes. So Right, you're kind of splitting hairs, but right, this is uh, interesting. When my research instructions were very close to what what the practice, what the industry was was telling us to. So, um, a couple a couple of uh, charts here that um, that I uh, didn't have. Um, maybe this yeah, this one was in the uh, in the article. So you see the percentage of change just over the step step count range um, for the participants. So you see the exemplar performer feedback, huge change. We see some, right, you see a decrease in the zero bins here, an increase in the 100 bins. So you see then that that feedback did something most likely for participants um, uh, two and eight. And just a couple graphs here for um, just so you can kind of see like the efficiency, the changing in, in, uh, in, um, in, in the participant physical activity levels. You have the different step count ranges. So if you have a, a bin here, uh, if you if you walked 76 steps or 89 steps, you would get counted here in this bucket. So when you see the different phases we see in feedback one for a responder, you see their activity kind of shift in this 100 to 200 step kind of range. So you see shift in those histograms basically. Whereas if somebody doesn't doesn't respond, you see that there's really no change in kind of that distribution of activity. So you can kind of see it in just different different ways. Um, so that's really kind of the percentage chart based on this is what you see on the Fitbit dashboard. You see, like, oh, this person who's a responder is moving every, you know, every half an hour, every 20 minutes, like they're supposed to. Somebody who doesn't respond, their their histogram will visually um, will look like that. So, um, you know, in practice, you know, here, just uh, as I have a couple minutes here, um, every day, and I, I work with clients around the globe. Um, I help address goals related to physical activity and sedentary behavior recommendations. So we target step counts, regular movement 
exercise minutes, just kind of how I kind of learned from research here and have kind of refined my practice um, um, over time. So um, that's really all I have, I have time for um, today. So I think we can kind of close on, you know, I, I'm just appreciative of, of the opportunity and the platform to speak with everybody here. Um, again, nice surprise that was such an international audience. Um, so if one of my lessons or research idea changes, you know, one of your behaviors related to um, a, a research agenda item or, you know, how you think about your practice today, if it makes you or someone healthier, right, I scared Thanos out of his chair, then for me, you know, this hour, this two hours of time here, preparation, it was all worth it. And that's what uh, that's what it's all about for me. So um, I appreciate all of the time and attention. Um, and uh, you can follow me here. If, I don't know if you have your phone. You could scan. It's easy to you go to my homepage. That's where my blog is. Visit behaviorfit.com. I have a podcast called Behavior Fit Radio. So go ahead and connect me and I'll pause here. So thank you very much, Nick. Um, mm -hmm. Guys, if you have um, some questions, please do uh, pop them in the chat. Just to say that our last keyword is movement. Our last keyword is movement. Now, please note this. You can email me and I'll pop the email here. And what I want you to do is this. Pop the three keywords, your full name as you want it on the certificate. And if you're BCBAs, please use the certification number, not your account number from the BACB, okay? It should be your certification number. And please email me no later than the end of the week and I will prep them. We have about 40 days. Uh, that's the leeway that the BACB gives us to uh, distribute them. So don't worry if you email me and you have to wait for a few weeks before I get back to you. I do receive your emails and uh, if there are any uh, issues, you can always chase me up. Uh, Nick, can I ask you a quick question? Something that sure. intrigued me. I see that you use mm -hmm. quite a lot of histograms. Uh, do mm -hmm. you think that I, they might be more appropriate as visual displays? Um, and I'm asking because, you know, as behavior analysts, we're quite used to looking at the usual equal interval line graphs. Uh, mm -hmm. So would you recommend that for this particular type of data analysis, histograms might be a better visual display? Yeah, I think it uh, just kind of counter that it just depends on like what what information are you trying to show, right? If, if it's a categorical if it's a categorical variable like the bins and everything, then of course you want to show that on the x x axis. Of course, um, I played a, a lot around with just different visualizations nowadays. So it's really um, you know, think about like what's the story you want to tell, and then you kind of work backwards from that. But I think there's a lot of room for just showing things differently, interesting you know, in a different way. Um, also consider the audience, right? A Java graph is going to be black and white, very boring. <laughs> but if I am giving my own kind of presentation like this, I might jazz it up a little bit. You know, here's a <clears throat> here's a good example here. Great, Ooh. I think great, great question that this is a client, um, a client uh, a dashboard that I have. So uh, this is total exercise minutes. And we looked at the type of activity she logged and so you see where do sorry the question is where do all the activity minutes come from so when this data was made when i took the screenshot we see all these minutes from walk right so then i can ask okay what is it about walking is it more available do these other activities not exist or did it, the aerobic studio get shut down so you really it's always a question asking kind of idea right so gotcha thank thank yeah. you for that mm -hmm. kyle let's yeah, see you're welcome. hand raised uh, have you got a question Thank you for your application. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. Thank you, Kate. I can't I can't I can't hear Kyle saying anything, so I'm assuming that it's not necessarily a question. Okay, Nick, thank you as ever. Mm -hmm. uh, we thoroughly enjoyed this. This has been brilliant. And I'm thank sure you so much. inspired a lot of people to consider this. Um, we hopefully will have you again uh, joining us and uh, talking a bit more, uh, maybe going now a bit more advanced and uh, giving people some more ideas about how they could take this to the next level, especially mm -hmm. if they're thinking about health coaching and so on. Guys, Nick sure. has put his uh, email in the chat and don't forget as he said that he also has a podcast that you guys can follow and mm -hmm. um, check out his website as well. All right, thank you as ever. Thank you all. The, our next journal club is going to be with uh, Jonathan Amy talking about developing motor skills. So if you guys want to look into find or gross motor skills for your clients, make sure to keep an eye out for our next journal club. It's going to be 
uh, very interesting as well. All right, Nick, thanks again, mate. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Have a great one. Cheers, everybody. Yeah.